I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, the second half of a meeting of our sociology study group in which Krister Nylander introduces us to the practice of curious listening dialogue. I'd like to uh, just to introduce uh, Christian Nylander. Uh, we met through, um, it was Friends of Wisdom. Now um, we've branched off uh, most of us to become lovers of wisdom, uh, more general. Um, and so um, Christian and I, uh, just, I mean, many of us there, but certainly maybe first of all, Christian, um, he had uh, was proposing dialogue. He was saying that, the, you know, what the world needs is dialogue. Um, that's uh, that's how we could make the world more wise. And he had a very specific kind of dialogue in mind. Uh, he calls it uh, uh, curious listening dialogue. Uh, he explained that this is a friendly type of dialogue, um, that the purpose is to help us grow in the unconscious. So, Krista, please uh, enlighten us. Thank you. So this presentation is a very short summary of my dialogue concept. Before I start, I want to say that I believe uh, very much in what Jinnan says about natural cognition and that dialogues are only a step in the trans transformation to reduce the negative impact of the ego and to increase wisdom so that we can more and more understand and start living the way Jinnan points to. So, but first I was going to tell a background. So we all know that our civilization is in a very precarious situation with many global challenges and hundreds of social problems in every country. And uh, technological and societal complexity has increased exponentially and the collective wisdom has only increased a little. A widening wisdom gap between what is required to run a highly complex society and the present general wisdom level in the population will lead to total collapse if humanity does not become wiser. And earlier civilization have failed, according to me, due to this wisdom gap, which led to all sorts of disasters. So humanity has invested a lot in knowledge, but almost nothing in wisdom. So by wisdom, I mean the ability to foresee, understand and act on events in a way that is long term and favorable for all involved. So no, not many know what wisdom is or appreciates the term or know how wisdom can be developed. Some believe that we already have enough wisdom and that we just need some meditation, mindfulness, leadership courses or other short-term exercises. Many think that global challenges should be met with protests, changing laws, mental pressure, emission quotas, technological inventions, etc. But my approach is completely different in that the outer world will always be a mirror of our inner world. Uh, that means low level of general wisdom means a lot of problems everywhere. So how can we develop wisdom? I mean that listening, curious dialogue is the best way of developing wisdom at this stage. Before going into the details, I start with a short explanation how it works in practice. So I will describe a Zoom version uh, as this is relevant for Math for Wisdom. So number one, the participants are welcomed and the dialogue leader or leaders are introduced by name. Number two, the participants say their first names and tell what brought them here on this day. And three, the basic principles of Zoom dialogue are explained. For example, we raise our hands when we want to talk. We are here to listen to each other curiously and try to understand. We respect each other even when we think differently. We have no argumentation and do not demean. We do not seek consensus or common solutions. We value openness, honesty and personality. We try to observe what happens in the dialogue with ourselves and others. The the dialogue host can interrupt participants to give everyone time to talk. The camera is always on and the microphone off when we are not talking. And sensitive things uh, that are said stay in the group and no recording. And before the subject of the circle is described, partly in the title and partly in a shorter text. Number five, the dialogue begins with a question related to the topic. And number six, the dialogue host makes sure that 
everyone is involved, allocate time and stimulate a deeper dialogue. And the dialogue ends with a question about what the participants take with them after the conversation. And each dialogue is estimated to one to two hours uh, with a couple of breaks in between, a maximum of 15 people in a dialogue and no breakout rooms if we have less than 15 participants. So, so what hypothesis do I have that support this dialogue concept? So number one, learning and especially developing wisdom takes place mainly in the subconscious, which is thousands or millions of times larger than the conscious and extremely fast. It function as a brain. Number two, maximum inner development occurs if the subconscious receives large contrasts in the form of knowledge, experiences, insights, perspectives, attitudes, feelings, thoughts, memories, creativity, fantasies, expectations, ambitions, etc., from the participants in dialogue. The subconscious organizes, classifies, links, compares, associates, values, prioritizes, etc., its content. In this way, it can make well thought out subconscious decisions in a short time with many variables. Number three, maximum inner development occurs if the negative effects of the ego in dialogue are minimized in order to maximize the flow of input to the subconscious. This is achieved through dialogue rules and the avoidance of goal-driven and consensus-based dialogues. We want to avoid the ego's negative instincts that jump to conclusions, prepare counter-arguments, condemn, process fears, arouse emotions, interpret based on previous negative experiences, protect its identity, see weaknesses and threats in others, venting anger, etc. Number four, maximum inner development occurs if the dialogues take place on a regular basis. For example, every week over many years. This means that the whole or large parts of the population should regularly participate in dialogues. Then repetitive patterns that are difficult to change in thoughts, words, feelings, decision, and actions can be subconsciously reprogrammed. It is important to note that wisdom development is in no way related to indoctrination, nor is it, it related to the transmission of norms. Inner development should be an entirely individual inner subconscious process. Number five, only in listening dialogue can participants receive a wide range of narratives on a given topic that is lots of integrated mini narratives from participants. The narratives make it much easier for the subconscious to process the information compared to if the information came as separate units, for example, knowledge, perspectives, or emotions. Moreover, the stories are in real life dialogues conveyed through both verbal and nonverbal communication, which reinforces the input. In listening curious dialogue, it is not unusual that flow occurs, where the ego of the participants more or less disappears for a while. This is perfect for wisdom development and also very satisfying feeling in dialogue. Number six, inner skills developed in listening curious dialogues are holistic approach, deeper understanding of values, human needs and emotions, inner and outer leadership, critical analytical skills, creativity and problem solving skills, empathy, theoretical knowledge, conflict resolution, and a lot more. Number seven, subconscious development give rise to, among others, increasing intuition and creativity. 
simplifying difficult decisions, reducing hasty decisions, and creating better mental health as the negative influences of the ego are gradually reduced. In short, you become wiser. Number eight, I would also argue that when the influence of the ego is reduced, not only does access to the subconscious increase, but also our access to information that lies outside the subconscious. That means that we can access universal information. Nikola Tesla clearly described this phenomenon when he saw his inventions in thoughts and daydreams. Are there theories behind my claims? Yes. Among others, the prominent cognitive psychologist and researcher Arthur Reber, who is particularly known for his contribution in the field of implicit learning. He believes that all development of species takes place in the subconscious and that the behavior of all species, including children and adults, develops through subconscious learning. In fact, the conscious is a product of the subconscious. I would even argue that people cannot change by making conscious decisions. That is an illusion. Reality shows us this all the time in the form of, for example, broken New Year's resolutions and other promises to lose weight, take more <clears throat> public transport, exercise, be more social, etc. It is not until the subconscious mind is sufficiently mature that the change comes and stay. I think we should re reflect deeply on this. This is probably the most interesting um, reflection of this is that perhaps the case is that everything is happening in the subconscious. And when we reason, we think that we are thinking, we are logic and a lot of that. But maybe all, all this is prepared in our subconscious already. Um, so I think I stop there. Thank you, Krista. Aslan. So th this was uh, fascinating as um, someone who comes from a conflict ridden region of the world. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan border region uh, where we have um, you know, experienced uh, Taliban insurgency and um, which has been going on for at least 20, 25 years. And before that, other conflicts, right? So, and then my own um, study um, of conflict resolution uh, in my master's and now as a PhD researcher, I study conflict. So this is very interesting to know that this the dialogue uh, as a way to promote mutual understanding and uh, right um, um, probably you know not just at the bigger civilizational level but individual social group level right organizational level um, so that that's that's very reassuring. It's good to know, and I I I can imagine it. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Of course, it requires a lot of dedication, commitment, sincerity, presence. Um, you know. Um, but I also think. Uh, but but the question that I have is when you said that. Uh, you know this, probably. Um. I'm not presenting this as your like theory or as your definitive statement, but one of the things that you said is that probably all of this is happening at the subconscious level. Probably we're not making any conscious decisions for us, right? 
But that's interesting. So as someone who grew up as a Muslim, as a practicing Muslim, and who doesn't any longer believe in Islam or conform to Islam, um, but defines himself as an atheist. And my journey, I think, my intellectual journey has been a very conscious journey. The books that I have read, the, the decisions that I've made from, you know, in the past 20 years, and I think, of course, the pain that I went through in, in making those decisions and uh, the decision of like reassessing my judgments about the world, about rights and wrong and this and that. I think it was, I, I would say, I mean, maybe this is an illusion then, but um, as far as I can see and understand and know is that this I think I did, I did these things, you know, like the bookstores that I visited, like I just, the money that I've spent on books, I could have just spent on other things, right? Um, so it's like the, the choices that you make, I believe are quite deliberate, like for me, it's not just random that I just, I mean, I see, this is not to brag about myself, but I think the only way I can, that. And I don't even know if I, what I've done is right or wrong, but I don't see it in that light. But it's like, I what I'm trying to say is that the journey, because this was an example that came to mind very quickly, is that this was, this was all done consciously, or a lot of it was done consciously, right? So I'm not sure how, probably this is just beyond my understanding or our understanding, but, but I think... I don't know how much role do we as do we attribute or assign to consciousness and the, the, the choices that we make and the ones that are made. Um, but I make sense like I think it makes sense that probably we're making choices in the availability and the possibility of the realms of existences, right? So probably yeah, you pick from like whatever is possible and whatever is present. Probably you can't pick beyond that. Probably that makes sense in, in that way, but um, I don't know. Just a thought. Let me add a com comment or two here. Um, I've spent most of my time working with large environmental systems. And these are big things, lagoons that have 10 million gallons of shit in it, you know, sewage manure, that kind of stuff, and big tanks with bioreactors, lots of bacteria, lots of invertebrates, there are bugs all over the place, there's worms, there's fish, you interact with them and stuff like that. I find that working with that, you develop an understanding that is definitely not conscious, it's subconscious. And that this begins to resonate, at least in my experience, then with the fundamental way I view the universe as a whole, how I try and write about that, how I try and explain it with words, with language. I invent languages. I, I basically stopped doing that in about 2002 after having done some 14 of them. And I sat on one and I said, okay, this is going to be um, kind of a guidance document to help me try and figure other things out. But all the while, and I'm out there with boots and I'm working with pumps and you get really dirty and everything stinks and it's it's wonderful. I have a great time. And you integrate it with the world as a whole. It's not just a waste or manure management system. It's how does this how does this interrelate with forests, with air quality, with what we're doing to the soil? And I very much agree with uh, Christer that you know, we are hitting a point of real criticality when it comes to climate change and political insanity and all this sort of stuff. So I think this kind of intuitive, what I call intuitive understanding, uh, subconscious understanding, and the other aspect of that is uh, I live in an environment which is dominated by my wife's sculpture, and she does incredible things you can see. Right up there is a piece and there's a piece and and there are literally a hundred of these. I, I live in a, in a gallery or a museum that changes all the time. And 
when I have trouble trying to figure something out analytically, I go down in the middle of the night and I'll sit in the living room and there are 20 pieces and they're silhouetted against the, the front windows. And there's a sense of, of peace and understanding that comes from that. That again, is not a rational, specific kind of process. So I, I can see that and how you go. The problems I see with how we set it up on a human basis is how do we get people to do it? And I think maybe if we get technology that everybody participates in and they can learn that from how they interact with it on a local circular green economy kind of production of food, energy, and clean water, environmental sustainability. So I find all of this incredibly interesting and very exciting and we'll look forward to many future discussions with lots of crazy ideas. So we have to take it over, Andreas, are we about out of time? You're uh, muted. You're, you're muted. You're, and, you're muted Andreas. Andreas. I'd like everyone to have a chance to say at least something on these topics. Who would go next? I mean, I'll say something if nobody else has anything to say. Um, thinking about the the systemic problems in the world, um, I, I can't help but feel like there's, like you mentioned, there's wisdom missing. But then you like go back into history and you see like this evolution of wisdom that led us to where we are now. And I don't know, this is kind of controversial, but I, it seems to me at least there's some sort of correlation between these like ancient cultures that sort of laid the groundwork for our modern society and their use of like psychedelic rituals as a way to not only like bind their community but also to like understand things beyond themselves and now in the modern age we've like completely delegitimized rituals or psychedelics in any form so now we're just kind of like it's a it's like a dry you know pursuit and and it's like it's like you were saying it's like most of where we are it comes from the subconscious and we're trying to like reverse engineer that with the conscious and it feels like it feels like the consciousness is not large enough to grasp the subconscious and i think that is where you know like psychedelics have advanced our evolution in, in previous societies and i think that's part of what's missing today <laughs> yes. i know that's kind of weird to say but yeah, I, I think so. from the workshop, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like it's too dry, you know. You gotta, it's, I don't know, it's, I don't know how to articulate that without sounding crazy, but yeah, there's, there's definitely something. So, so I should brought bring that into the my dialogues, yeah, yeah, have everyone yeah. microdose or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. And then slowly ramp your way ramp your way up to a more heroic dose, and then you have the the leaders of society are the people that can handle the most surprising <laughs> of experiences, you know. <laughs> so Andreas and I and Samuel, we had these conversations for like <laughs> oh. <laughs> in Oneonta, New York. In yeah. Oneonta, yeah. Well, that was kind of proof, right? I mean, none of those leaders had any psychedelic experience and they just, they overthought it into the ground, you know? Well, I, I did feel good, so... Um... You see that on the world stage, like how many of these Congress members that are writing policy have ever had like a psychedelic experience that relates like the, the deep like biological ecology to our own cellular like psychology? There's, there's just almost like, well, it doesn't even exist on the social sphere, if, you know. If if you interchange psychedelic with paranormal, and I don't know how many of you have had a paranormal, which would not involve any kind of psycho psychotropic substances or what have you, mm -hmm. but a truly paranormal event, a synchronicity that makes absolutely no sense from a rational mm -hmm. point of view, um, 
and I've had a, quite a number of those, which it, it really, uh, it does change the way you look at, at everything else. So it's, I, I don't know how you, how I enjoyed you your, your presentation, Krishna. And uh, say, I enjoyed your presentation. I, a couple of questions come to mind though. One is, uh, how can I measure the scope or, or, or the, the knowledge of the subconscious? I mean, I kind of feel as does Aslam, most of my decisions are conscious, but who knows? Are they really conscious? But I think they're conscious. I can't I can't blame anybody except myself. Uh, so how can I how can I re relate the two? I mean, the conscious and the subconscious, and how can I measure or determine the existence or the, as, as I mentioned, the scope of the subconscious and where do I get it? Good question. Um, so maybe... I'm, 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 se I'm setting up, I'm trying to set up a pilot study in my city um, with researchers so that we could start dialogues and start measuring uh, what kind of human development uh, will result of dialogue. But I suspect there are, two, there are at least two variables. The one is that is to reduce the negative impact of the ego, because I think that's a big problem. And then it is to maximize the, uh, the contrasts and the volume of big data to the subconscious. So I think the second. What was the second one? Second is to to maximize the volume of big data, and a lot of contrasts in knowledge and perspectives and ambitions and etc. So that it's like artificial intelligence, big data, so that the subconscious has a lot to work with to classify, to prioritize, compare, and so on. So. So we think that we have a brain. We think that we think with the brain, but I'm not sure about that. We have a brain, of course, but we probably have something that is much bigger than the brain. Actually, that reminds me of a. Uh, um, uh, it was like from Nick, one of Nikola Tesla's like personal notebooks or something where he actually had a wiring schematic of the human body and he compared the brain to like the top of um a tesla coil and then he compared the spine your spinal cord as like the majority of the inductor coil and so basically your 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 spine is basically kind of like wirelessly you know interacting with your environment and other people and that's how you can like read the vibe of the room so to speak is because you know there's more equipment in this body than just the brain there's other sensors that we take for granted i think that fits perfectly into my my view and that also per, uh, fits in with Arthur Reber, who, who I told about, who, who uh, said that all species are developed un uh, subconsciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So then the brain is just a byproduct, uh, it's a visible product of the subconscious or the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Just a comment about the first two presentations uh, by Islam and Anders. I think, uh, I mean, the theory is fine, but uh, I'd like to see a few examples of practical everyday life. Uh, so, I mean, how do you apply these methods? Well, so uh, why don't I? I was. I'd like to. Maybe, maybe we can do that in the next another session. I mean, it's, uh... yes. But so, um, kind of like uh, we've had these different presentations. We had a good example of you know discussion dialogue that Krister can think about. You know where we're starting. Um, we can think about topics uh, to have. Uh, 
there's a couple of things I just want to have in mind uh, also um, as we think of topics for dialogue in the future. One is that uh, I will be visiting uh, the prison uh, locally in the city of Elitus. I'm corresponding with Andrus Yuzenas. He's really into physics, uh, but uh, we may talk about uh, epistemology, ways of figuring things out in physics and in sociology and things. So if we have ideas of discussion that I could bring there, that would be very helpful and interesting. Also with Jerry, um, uh, we have the Language of Wisdom uh, working group, but he's very concerned about uh, practical consequence. So, of course, he mentioned here. Um, I wanted to alert Jerry right away um, that Krister and I participate in this Lovers of Wisdom group, and we have subgroups. Uh, Krister leads the dialogue subgroup, I lead the theory subgroup, but there is a climate action subgroup. Uh, we're three, four really wonderful people who really want to take action, you know, wise action. So I really encourage you to join that group. And because we're both there, and then you could be in that subgroup. And I think that you may find a real support for practical action there um, that may go faster than in, at Math for Wisdom. Um, and so then um, in terms of practical application, I want to maybe just give a little bit of theory like from Plato. So Plato has, uh, which I think you may have, uh, I know you've heard of, and Plato's Republic talks about uh, the soul, you know, being like a city where you have like three different classes of people. So you have the craftsmen, farmers, you have the uh, soldiers, you have the rulers. And the virtues, you know, the craftsmen, farmers, like they have these passions and they're kind of like the unconscious, you see. The, the, Soldiers are like bullies, and they're kind of like the conscious. They're trying to, they know how to make order. But it's the uh, rulers who need to be wise and to organize everything. See, and so from Plato's point of view, if the if the farmers, you know, craftsmen rule with their passions, there's going to be problems. You see, it's just going to, it's going to all fall apart. Although that is the foundation, you know, that's the foundation. But if the bullies rule, you know, the soldiers rule, there will also be problems. So it's very important that the wise people rule. Now, what does that mean practically? So someone like Aslam came uh, from, um, you know, the hinterland in Pakistan to the capital, I think. Or was it the, where, where did you study Aslam? Oh, I studied uh, in the village and then in another city and then another city. Yeah. And then you came to the U.S. You see. So one of the, that illustrates, uh, so for example, my father was in a refugee camp, he came to Chicago, but then he decided to go to California, right? We take ourselves out of one environment into another environment. You know, we all met at the, uh, the Let Me Think Scholarship Workshop, Samuel, uh, you and I, um, Samuel been traveling around all over. So when we do this traveling, but it's specifically when we plant ourselves in environment, you know, you get a job or you're doing some project uh, or like we were at that workshop, that has a huge effect on the unconscious, okay? But it's the consciousness that decides, I'm going to go there. And then you get all these new uh, you know, experiences. So like Christer has said, right? Uh, the, the wiser you'll be, the more experiences you have to process, right? But somebody's gotta be processing them. You see like, so if you're, if you're going there deliberately and you have things you want to do, like I've gotten a lot more from traveling by going somewhere like Oneonta with a definite purpose, but simply absorbing the environment secondhand. I didn't go to be a tourist. You see, you'll get much less from an environment if you go as a tourist. You'll get much more if you go with a purpose, like you, you've come to, you know, Rutgers, right? Like, so you get a different experience of New Jersey, you know, or my father as a refugee child, right, in, uh, in uh, Germany, right? Like, if you're there, um, not as a tourist, but you're there to be living your life, right? Then you absorb. So that's a simple example of um, how we can feed our unconscious, but doing it with deliberately with our conscious and control. We choose, you know, I chose to live among gangs, let's say in Chicago. I chose to live with my grandmother. She had two years of schooling, but I thought she's the wisest, loveliest person I could be with, my father's mother. So, um, so maybe the, the, like how to balance these three. So I'm very much in favor of uh, learning more about the unconscious because we need to know a lot about it. And so having these dialogues where we grow it, like, but there's other ways like music. So Samuel's an expert about music, uh, but Christer's presentation was very um, cerebral, right? There could have been images, there could have been music. Our dialogue could have music and images, right? Uh, we could have dancing. So. I was very pleased um, when uh, Samuel and Aslam, you know, we did 
talk about uh, drugs. We we represented different subcultures, let's say. But when Samuel said, Andres, you don't need to take psychedelics, you see, I felt that was a great affirmation of my life choices. You know, like maybe there are people who should, right? But you don't have to take psychedelics to be silly, right? Or to uh, to do a rock and roll presentation, right? Or to, right? I mean, or at least, you know, give me some slack, right? Like so. There's what, or so like, or the idea of God, you know, like if you believe like a child, you know, with all your heart in God, well, that can take the place a second. That's a trip, right? Like, so that's a real trip to believe in God and to try to listen to God, right? And so, um, the, the, like, like those are paranormal experiences. Yeah, your your presentation on the philosophy of cleaning was the highlight of the <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, and Samuel is a star of one of our videos. If you ever saw. Um, so we'll have, yeah, but so maybe um, and I know <laughs> <laughs> scholars. The toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's the view from the other end of the pipe that's the most interesting. <laughs> believe me. <laughs> um. So maybe uh, we've gone for an hour and forty minutes. Um. Uh, maybe then we could just conclude with our thoughts. Uh. I think this notion of drugs was brought up by Ryan and Kirby affirmed the last time that the sociology of drugs. Another thing that relates is. This abduction, deduction, induction, we talked about like how an individual uses these modes of reasoning. But what Christer is doing, he's saying uh, something important to us. How can society reason? So he's saying, look, society can be wiser. How? It's not going to happen by reasoning, right, directly like that. How do we get uh, our farmers to be, you know, moderate, right? Like so our, 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 our soldiers to be not bullies, but brave, you know, and our, and our wise people to be, um, you know, into beauty, into the correct type of thing. So um, what do we propose to, do we continue with this notion, with this idea of the, the psycho, the, the sociology of addiction, mental illness, like the good and the bad? Is that, uh, and maybe their role in society thinking, like how can we, maybe the question is like, how can that kind of thing affect society's thinking? Like how can society's thinking change or reason or improve? Is that something we could talk about? So in two weeks, I would like to talk about Michael Poliani, The Study of Man, a book. Mm -hmm. I uh, think that really, Michael, Michael Poliani, he was a physicist, yeah, sociologist. Yeah, yep. and he also wrote uh, personal knowledge, which is based on the study of man. I think the study of man very much uh, links to what I what we talked about today. Uh, it's based on three of his lectures. I think more digestible, easier for me than Pierce's um, writings. I think he is also notorious for his, you know, very messy writing, which is hard to understand. Very hard. But yeah, Poliani is, it's very, I, I liked, I loved his book. So I'll uh, try to, I'll re, I've read the book and uh, I'll present on the book. So this time, hopefully with more visuals, I, um, I, I have to learn a lot from Andreas. Um, you know. Well, I, as, as you have time, but what is the study of man about? It's about um, uh, it's it's about again theory of knowledge. Okay, theory of knowledge is Poliani's theory of knowledge. Like how again, how, like you know, I I briefly mentioned is articulate knowledge, inarticulate knowledge. So I think a lot of that has to do with the unconscious and the conscious. Oh, like tacit and explicit, right? Yeah, like tacit say, knowledge exactly. and explicit. So I think maybe it. It's good to, um, or unless you have something else in mind. Okay, but so so then it's agreed that could we meet all of us in two weeks? You would like us it's be a meeting of our group, is that right? Or I, yeah, I would like to okay. present. Okay, and you can give a presentation on this, and then that would relate to this topic of uh, social reasoning versus personal reasoning. Is that would that be helpful on that topic, or is that a topic we could discuss? Yeah, I think that yes, and I I, I would even say the the articulate be an articulate. You know how sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there is also one can also link this to wisdom, right? Just because someone goes to a fancy university doesn't mean he is wise, or he should right listen to his grandfather in the village, or like to some person on the street. 
because wisdom and understanding and knowledge doesn't just come from getting a degree. And, and an, ex an, an, example, an example of that inarticulate, and it was mentioned whether Samuel or Christopher about the Tesla coil inside people, right? But um, the way I think of that is uh, what I call the sixth sense, um, where um, we have synchronicity of our bodies if we're non-autistic. So m most humans, if they stand together, they stand in very harmony, kind of like patterns and you know they they their bodies reflect each other if one person shifts the other people shift if someone's autistic that's they true. don't have that that's basically i think what autism is is you don't have that you're cut off from people you don't sink in easily and you're kind of like you know you have to somehow compensate because you're not uh, and there's a ranges of that uh, with asperger syndrome but so oh, that's wow. like having that coil some people have that coil inside of them and some people but a few people don't right so that's inarticulate knowledge but it's social and so it relates, I think, um, one of the things that made us human, uh, go, to go back to evolution, to go back to what Christopher said, was um, there's, a, there's a researcher, Tomasello, and he talks about um, uh, joint intentionality. Like we came together here with a shared purpose, right? And, but we can leave and then be in other small groups with shared purposes, you see? And then we may have rewards and we may share those rewards and things like that. So that's what... Uh, we're able to have teams in this very flexible way that uh, and so in Zoom, it's hard, but 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 in real life, it's easier because uh, you can look at body language. You can just uh, subconsciously, unconsciously, you reflect each other, mirror each other, you sort it out. Uh, you get very a lot of clues. So um, the point being that this kind of joint internationality makes it human. It's kind of supportive uh, or kind of maybe uh, fits in with what Krista was saying, like, OK, that's how we evolve. But that supported us. I think to become more conscious in some way also, you know, like that it's just a foundation for how we were able to be. But look, you look at all the animals, they all have, uh, I mean, many of them have uh, split hemispheres, right? So I think all the ones that have split hemispheres have that distinction between the, the unconscious and the conscious. But to have a strong third mind that's able to bridge them, that's what we want to develop as humans, I think. So so then the, the to conclude, like, so uh, Aslam would give a presentation uh, in the beginning um, on the study of man. And then maybe, Christopher, could you come next time and lead this uh, dialogue? Uh, and we will formulate a question. But I think the question would be, uh, how, can, how does society reason and how can we support that reasoning? Is that, is that a decent question? And, you know, maybe what's the role of drugs or mental illness or et cetera. But we'll let's, formulate uh, that. Yeah, let's reflect on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but are you, would you be able to come, Krister, in two weeks? Yes. Okay, so we're... Also, uh, I, am... I can't make the ninth. So anything other than the two weeks from today is the ninth of November. I can't yeah, so we'll it. see you next time then. You know, we'll 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 skip yeah. that, but uh, just to keep this time. Sure. Um, well, but I'm you... also happy to, like, I don't mean to just be talking all the time. So I'm happy to just be a listener and participant if uh, someone else wants to. Well, could you give a short uh, presentation? I mean, how long do you want for your uh, presentation on the theory of me? The, I think that'd be nice uh, input for our subconscious, right? In 15 minutes. I'll, no, I won't go longer. You know, 15 minutes would be optimal. You know, if you go 20, 25, I think that's okay. Is that right, Christian? And then we'll have at least an hour and maybe an hour and a half, hopefully, for. Yeah, fine. Did we get a feeling of today of the kind of dialogue you want? Is this a little bit like that? Is it in the spirit of. Yes. So, so uh, next time we are focusing on one question and mm -hmm. we just. We, we try to let that question flow okay. and see see where it can take us mm -hmm. without um and just and slow down a little right so that so that we reflect um we don't have to go in a hurry um but otherwise it went very good today Okay, so that's a good uh, kindergarten step. We're very mm. happy. I'm very mm. happy to see Samuel. I'm happy to see Jerry uh, and, and uh, my father and, of course, Islam. And is that all of six of us, I guess? And uh, so who would conclude with a... Uh,
prayer for us or just you know like a connection with the psychedelic god beyond us i don't know <laughs> i uh, uh samuel do you want to do it um sure i'll uh burn some sage for us here okay. <laughs> um <clears throat> I'm grateful for our time together and the development of our consciousness together. And um, I'm really excited about the progress that uh, humanity is making in the spiritual realms. And we pass that forward to the next generation that will inherit our decisions. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm getting a lot out of Math for Wisdom, so for me to put in a few bucks every month, I'm not thinking twice about it. Uh, anybody who joins this group uh, is going to get a lot out of it, so why not throw a few bucks uh, through Patreon into the pot? Uh, Patreon's great. It makes it so easy to contribute. It's two minutes to set it up, it's done.